events and opportunities coming up soon. First is that starting tomorrow morning, um, Pastor and Sue is giving us a wonderful video devotional. So every weekday, Monday through Friday at six o'clock, starting at six o'clock, you can go onto our YouTube channel and find a wonderful message from Pastor and Sue. So we encourage you to check those out. This Tuesday, we have our next STARS luncheon, that's Seniors Talking and Remembering the Seasons, and it is our Christmas luncheon. So that will be 11.30 on Tuesday. We'd love for you to join us. If you plan to come, please do just sign up on the bulletin board right outside these doors. This Saturday is the day that perhaps you have been waiting for all year, the Cookie Walk. Um, we have a fabulous, fabulous cookie walk that will start at 9 in the morning and go until noon or until the cookies are sold out. I would highly recommend getting here early because uh, we've been known to sell out before. Also, if you, like me, signed up to make cookies, this is your last reminder to actually make those cookies and bring them to the church this week so that they can be sold. A week from today is going to be our Children of Joy uh, Christmas play. That will be at 5 o'clock right here in the sanctuary, and it will be followed by a pizza dinner. So come and support all of our kids, whether or not you have a kid in the program. I know it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. Finally, for a little bit later on your calendar, um, Thursday, December 21st is going to be our Jazz Nativity. Um, if you haven't experienced this incredible musical event yet, um, you're not going to want to miss it. And if you've been before, then you know uh, that you're going to want to make sure to have a ticket this year as well. Um, you can get tickets in the narthex in between services. And if you forget, you can also uh, call the Keenan Auditorium box office and they will get you set up. Finally, I just wanted to say that if you are new here or newer here, we would really love a chance to connect with you. As you can see, there's a lot going on in the life of our church, and we'd love to tell you about it and hear about your story. So if you would, fill out a Connect card that you can find in the pew rack in front of you. It's bright blue and green. Um, and then just place that in the offering plate later on in the service. Again, we'd love the chance to get to know you a little bit. Now I invite you to take a big, deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship.
the King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. Who is this King of glory? How shall we call him? He is Emmanuel, the promised of ages. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. Open the gates before him, lift up your voices. Our opening congregational prayer for Advent is found in your bulletin, and it is written by the wonderful writer and theologian Henry Nouwen. Let's pray this now together. Lord Jesus, master of both the light and the darkness, send your Holy Spirit upon our preparations for Christmas. We who have so much to do and seek quiet spaces to hear your voice each day. We who are anxious over many things look forward to your coming among us. We who are blessed in so many ways long for the complete joy of your kingdom. We whose hearts are heavy seek the joy of your presence. We are your people walking in darkness yet seeking the light. To you we say, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'd now like to invite the Hedgecock family to come forward to light our Advent candle. morning. Isaiah 60, 2 through 3. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ our hope. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. you now to stand and join together in our opening hymn number 211, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We'll sing the first four verses.
before you sit down, please greet those around you with the peace of Christ. Church. My name is Eunseo Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here. It is my great joy to lead us in our prayer. Please join me as we pray together. Holy and loving God, as we gather here on this first Sunday of Advent, our hearts are filled with anticipation and hope. We come before you with grateful heart, thankful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate in this season of Advent. Lord, in this season of waiting and preparation, we ask that you prepare our hearts and minds to receive your word and your love. Help us to set aside the busyness and distractions of this world so that we can focus on you and your promises. Help us not to lose sight of the true purpose of Advent. May our heart be centered on you, Jesus, as we remember your promise that you are with us always. As we light the first Advent candle symbolizing hope, we are reminded of the hope that you bring into our lives. In a world filled with uncertainty and darkness, you are the source of our hope and our salvation. We place our trust in you, knowing that you are the light that shines in the darkness. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling and hurting during this Advent season. We especially pray for peace in Israel and Gaza. May your peace reign in these areas. Now, we pray for these whom we name with our voices or in our heart.
Lord, in your never-ending mercy, in your great goodness, hear our prayers. May your love and comfort surround them, and may they find hope in you. As we continue with our worship service today, may your presence be felt among us. May our worship be pleasing to you, and may it bring glory to your name. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our heart and gift as we respond to God's grace and generosity. You can contribute to the Minister of Ricefield United Methodist Church for God's work by placing your gift on the plate or using the QR code in the insert. Now, I want to invite our ushers to come forward to receive our offerings and tithes. <laughs>
It is time for a children's message. So if there are any kids, welcome to comfort and join me this time. Today. Good. Good, good. I'm Pastor Unsu and I'm so excited to share this time with you. So today I have brought something special. Look at this balloon. Yes, and when you look at a balloon like this, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? A yes. Birthday. Birthday? Birthday. 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 Party. Party. Yes, birthday and parties, right? Yeah, yeah, you got it. Birthday and birthday parties. So happy birthday. Actually, well, last week I had my birthday and Pastor Julia gave me um, this balloon for his really happy birthday party. So, yeah, I love that. So we are in December, right? And um, actually today is the first day of a very special season. In the season in which... We are looking forward to someone's birthday. Can you guess whose birthday? Yes. Okay, can you say together? One, two, three. Jesus. Great, right? Jesus' birthday. And then we call this sometimes Christmas, right? But Christmas is Jesus' birthday. And the time of waited, um, and waited, uh, waited this time we called Advent. So today is first Sunday of Advent. And Advent means the coming of someone or something very important. So it is like countdown to celebrating Jesus' birth at Christmas. Um, so um, just as we see Christmas trees or Christmas decorations or we hear Christmas songs all, all around us, we have also special symbols or signs for Advent. For example, we light this Advent candle this morning, and look at that. We have, we decorate um, purple colors paramount um, our sanctuary with our sanctuaries. So these are very special symbols or signs for Advent. So now we know that we are eagerly waiting for Jesus' birthday with this beautiful decoration and with excitement. But do you know why it is so important to celebrate Jesus' birthday? Yes, because Jesus is Christ the Lord, right? Jesus is not just an ordinary person. Jesus is the Christ our Lord. Jesus is Son of God. And Jesus is sent to earth to bring us hope, peace, joy, and love. So you can find these four words on that paramount. Can you see that? Hope peace, love, and joy. And these are the really great and big gift for us from God. So this is the reason why Advent is a very special time for us to remember this incredible gift from God. So now I want us to get ready for this Christmas with excitement, like more excitement, and prepare this season, as such as well, we prepare for someone's birthday party with decorations or cakes or gifts. We can also prepare for this season and Christmas by making our heart ready. So, such as we can spend more time in prayer and reading the Bible. And or we can share our loves and show our loves with others. And we can be more kind and be forgiving someone. So these are ways to prepare for this time. So beloved Rice Field Kids, are you ready to prepare for this season? Mm. Yes, great. And with excitement and, fin and full of your heart? Okay, great. Not just Santa Claus, but preparing for this way and this time to eagerly want to see Jesus. Okay? Great. Let us pray together. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us your son, Jesus Christ. 
help us prepare our heart to celebrate Jesus' birthday with our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with, with me. You can go by your side. You can see it. Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace to you. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it's good to be here on the first Sunday of Advent, as Pastor and Sue just explained to us. And so uh, we're looking forward to um, a lot of things happening in the next few weeks, but I wanted to tell you briefly about our upcoming preaching schedule. I'm going to be talking about Joseph today. Pastor and Sue and Pastor Julia are going to be talking about Mary in the next couple of weeks. And then on Christmas Eve, of course, I'll be talking about Jesus and then uh, the week after that, uh, Pastor David's going to be um, talking to us about the wise men. So we've got a lot to look forward to in the uh, traditional Christmas story. Um, but um, uh, today we're going to take it from a, a bit of a different angle. I think most of us are most familiar with Luke's story. We're going to pick it up with Matthew in chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together... She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he'd resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, as we look at the most important characters in the Christmas story, I pray that you will teach us what our role is in this story. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, if we only had Matthew's gospel, that was the only one we had. What would we have? Like I said, the more popular version of Jesus' birth story comes from the Gospel of Luke. He begins with Zechariah and Elizabeth and the birth of John the Baptist, who came to prepare the way for the Messiah. Then we go on to the Virgin Mary and the miracle birth of a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. But if you only had Matthew's version of the story, what would you have? Well, there'd be no annunciation from the angel to Mary. There'd be no visit to Elizabeth or Mary's song, the Magnificat. No detail on cousin John's miraculous birth. No enrollment to call the Holy Family to Bethlehem in the first place. No overcrowded inn. No stable. No manger. No sheep. No cattle lowing when the baby awakes. No angels singing from the realms of glory. No shepherds watching their flocks by night. None of that is included in Matthew's gospel. So if you only had Matthew, what would you have? Well, you'd have Joseph. And across the ages, we venerate Mary and sing about shepherds who rush to see a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We are hushed by the angels singing sweetly o'er the plains. And the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. We even tell tales of an innkeeper who isn't really in the story, a drummer boy who's purely fictional, and kindly beasts who were just assumed to be there. But we have none of that in Matthew. Matthew begins with what we in our day consider to be the somewhat boring details of Joseph's genealogy tracking back across the centuries to show the connection of this baby with all the people who've come before him. 
linking Jesus through Joseph to the long journey of faith, beginning with Abraham and Isaac, going to David and Solomon, through the exile and the Babylonian captivity, all of it building toward the birth of this child. Matthew focuses on Joseph's dream and Joseph's response. And in less than a sentence, he tells the entirety of the birth story itself. And then, well, if you were to keep going, he fast forwards about two years to the mysterious visit of the Magi from the east, followed by King Herod's brutal response when he orders the slaughter of Bethlehem's babies. And of course, it is Joseph who once again comes out the hero. He has another dream and saves the child by taking his family to Egypt, where they live as refugees until King Herod dies. So if you only had Matthew, and you only had Joseph, what would you have? Well, first of all, you have a declaration of comfort, and a promise that everything is going to be all right, through three small words. Don't be It's worth knowing that this message is repeated over and over again in the other Gospels as well. It is said to Zechariah and Elizabeth, it is said to Mary, it is said to the shepherds, and now to Joseph, don't be afraid. It's this redundant but all-important promise which provides the reoccurring theme that runs throughout the whole story. When God calls, when God acts, when God moves, the first promise is the promise to cast out all fears. Don't be afraid. I tell you, if an angel showed up at my door, the first thing the angel would have to say to me is don't be afraid because I would be freaking out. Now, some of y'all might be, oh, how sweet, an angel's come to visit me. I would be thinking, oh, my God. Am I about to die? Have I died already? What is going on here? What do you want from me? Are you going to ask me to do something really hard? Could this just have been sent in a text or an email maybe? I think a burning bush would be easier to handle than an angel coming to speak to me. Perhaps we'd all be scared in such a situation. And God knows that. So even though it may be frightful to find yourself in the presence of an angel... And even though life certainly has its frightful moments, and there are plenty of things to fear, if God is present and active, his first invitation is always the invitation to go beyond our fears as the primary force in our lives and discover a calm center in the midst of the crisis. Messages from angels always begin by saying, don't be afraid. No matter how bad the news, no matter how worked up the newscaster may be, do not allow fear to control and dominate your life. Yes, the world can be frightful, and nobody knows that better than Joseph, but the world, world will not have the last word. God is always present, and by his grace, we need not fear. So if you only have Matthew, and you only have Joseph, once again, you have a promise of comfort that comes to everybody in the story, because you have three words. Don't be afraid. Secondly, if you only have Matthew, and you only have Joseph, you've got a name. Jesus, and a nickname or a title for Jesus, Emmanuel. Matthew borrows from the Old Testament prophet. Once again, he's making the connection with the long prophetic history of covenant faith, and he gives this child a name. He says, you shall call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means the Lord saves. And they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew takes the prophet Isaiah's words of comfort and assurance from another time, another century, 
and offers them as the name of the one who will come among us, Joseph's son. I think the great hymn writer Charles Wesley says it better than I can. He said, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, Hail the incarnate deity, Pleased with us in flesh to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. When you strip away all the frills and flourishes, all the angel wings and starlight, when you take away the shepherds on bended knee, the sheep in the hay and the cattle lowing, when you get right to the heart of it, this is what lies at the heart of the Christmas story, that God has not left us alone. He is ever present with us. He's no longer just out there somewhere, but has come to be with us, to live with us in the flesh, to share in our lives, to even experience our pain, going all the way with us to our death in order to make known God's unending, undeserved, unfathomable, unlimited love. I recently came across an article on the internet entitled, This Crazy World Could Sure Use a Direct Word from God. The author offers a laundry list of everything that's currently troubling the world. Wars, of course, diseases, natural disasters, the ugliness of hate and racism, the prevalence of violence both here and abroad. And then she says, she says I've come to the conclusion that there's only one answer, that God is going to have to get down here and settle things once and for all. She says, sure. It'd be a little freaky if the world came to a halt and there was God in a burning bush or a chariot of fire, but I say it's time. Well, here's the thing. God has already done that. God has already come down here to settle things once and for all. God has already spoken. He has spoken in the form of a child born to Joseph and Mary spoken through the parables of an itinerant teacher and healer, spoken in the way that that man treated others, spoken ultimately from a cross, and spoke, no dare I say, shouted from an empty tomb. And if we're not going to listen to the word that he's already spoken, there's little chance we're going to listen to the next one either. You know, I enjoy going to church leadership conferences from time to time. But oftentimes, when, uh, after listening to all the ideas and suggestions from the different speakers, I often say to myself, I kind of knew that already. And it leads me to the conclusion that I know more than I'm doing. The truth is, we probably all do. God could send another direct word into this crazy world, but the fact is we already know more than we're doing. We have heard. We have seen God's word already. It was made flesh in Jesus Christ. We already know that we should do unto others as we would have them do unto us. We already know that we should love our enemies and pray for those who despise us. We already know that the peacemakers are blessed and shall be called children of God, that the meek are blessed and shall inherit the earth, that the merciful are blessed and shall receive mercy. We already know that we should forgive 70 times 7. We already know we should turn the other cheek. We already know that it's more blessed to give than to receive. We already know that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and that love never ends. We've already seen and heard the word from God, and we've beheld his glory. Glory as the only begotten son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Frankly, we already know more than we're doing. We already know this one named Jesus, who came to save us from our sin. This one called Emmanuel, which means God with us, who is indeed already with us. 
So if you only have Matthew and you only have Joseph, you've got a promise and you've got a name. And that name means God with us. And finally, you have a task. The angel said, Joseph, heads up. I got a job for you. Well, that's the Doug Lane version of the Bible. Uh, angel said, take Mary as your wife. She's going to bear a son. You're going to call his name Jesus. Get up. Get going. It's time to move out of the comfort zone of the carpenter shop and take up the task of carrying the Christ into the world, into a world of corrupt rulers, and I'm going to ask you to go live among struggling refugees. You are entrusted, Joseph, with this task of preserving the gift, of nurturing the message, of caring for the good news. Maybe this is why we prefer Luke's version. Perhaps we prefer an advent focused on looking back across the ages to the warm memories of shepherds in the fields and silent nights, a baby born in a barn and adoring angels surrounding him. Perhaps we prefer a Hallmark Christmas or the Thomas Kincaid version, all misty and glowing candlelight and shimmering snow. And of course, Luke's gospel has its place, for sure. But Matthew won't leave us there. No, if your lead character is Joseph, the Christmas story becomes one of awesome responsibility. A tale told in the face of warring worlds of unjust rulers, of suffering refugees, in the presence of families huddling and hiding and babies born in barns. <clears throat> if your lead character is Joseph, the Christmas angel comes with a calling, comes with a task. There's work to be done, and it's up to you to go and do it. Several years ago, Marjorie Holmes wrote a fictionalized version of the Nativity, attempting to fill in the blanks, telling the love story. Joseph and Mary. It was called Two from Galilee. And after the word from the angel, she describes the conversation between Mary and Joseph, capturing his struggle with this call and this task. Mary says to him, Joseph, you don't believe. For all your reading of the scripture, you don't believe. And Joseph replies, Mary, I do believe. I do believe God will keep his promises. The Christ will come someday, but not now. Not to us in our time, in our town. Not to us and our neighbors. Not to you and me. Uh-uh. No, no, no. This great event is going to happen far, far away to other people. That will make it credible and safe. People will not have it. They will not have evidence that God will keep his promises if it becomes personal. Personal involvement in God's plan is just too terrible. It costs too dearly. Well, fictional Joseph, maybe you're right. We all want to see God at work someplace else. We want to see God's kingdom come, God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven, but we would prefer it's through anyone other than us. We want to see the promises fulfilled, sure, but certainly not here, not now, not in our time, not in our town. Certainly not through us because it's just too hard. It costs too dearly to become personally involved with God. But to encounter the angel of Advent is to become part of this mission and this calling. The task given to Joseph becomes our task as well to carry the Christ into the world. So if you only have Matthew's gospel, all you'd have is Joseph. And if all you have is Joseph, well, you got a promise. You have a name, and you have a task. And Matthew says very plainly, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel commanded him. May it be so, even in us today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now I'd like to...
continue our service with Holy Communion, so I encourage you to turn to page 12 in your hymnal. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for a joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray in the silence. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we are yet sinners. That proved God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Continuing on page 13, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to God, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us here and on all these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to ask those who are going to assist if they'll come forward now. And I want to remind everyone that the bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup of salvation for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Ushers will um, invite you to come forward at the appropriate time, but I want to let you know that everyone here is invited to participate in this holy meal. 
Um, you don't have to be a member of Wrightsville United Methodist Church or any church for that matter. You simply have to be able to say yes to Jesus. And so as you come forward, come forward ready to receive the elements, and then you'll be given a piece of bread. Go ahead and consume the bread, and then you'll take one of the cups and then drink from the cup, and you can put the cup in one of these receptacles when you're done. There's also a gluten-free station over here in the corner. After you're done, you can go back to your seat for a time of prayer, or if you'd rather, you can stay up here and kneel um, for a time of prayer as well. Um, again, this is, not, this is not our meal. This is not something that Wrightsville UMC is necessarily hosting. It's Jesus who is the host. We are all his guests. So come, taste and see that the Lord is good.
Well, what a wonderful, unfortunate problem to have, to uh, <laughs> run out of communion elements. Um, our um, closing hymn is going to be found on page 196. We'll just sing the first verse of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Let's stand and sing. joy of every longing heart. You know, if you only had Matthew's version of the story, you're missing a lot, right? You'd really only have Joseph. But if you only have Joseph, well, you've got a promise not to be afraid. You've got a name, Jesus and Emmanuel, which means God with us. And you've got a task to take care of Christ and reveal him to the world. So go forth in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. May you run and not be weary. May your heart be filled with song. May the love of God continue. Give you hope and keep you strong And may you run and not be weary May your life be filled with joy And may the road that you travel always be with you